live video is starting. It's so exciting. Hi, Ellen. Hi from Portland. Hi, Anna from Lily Hammer. Oh, yay, we're on Facebook too. Gosh, it's just amazing how many things there are to go wrong now. It used to be all you had was a butter churn, but it always worked, you know? And all the butter you could, except the cow would die. Cows didn't always work. Cows are like computers. They have minds of their own. What can I say? How are you all? So lots of people on Instagram. Tracy's there on Facebook. Hello. And usually I start when we have 100 people on Facebook, but we've got 150 on Instagram and it's going up fast. Oh, 28 on Facebook. Woo. What's the even, what's the point with the numbers? Hi, Dee Dee from Austin. Hello, Esther. Hello, Jessica. <sighs> So good to see you all. All right, we've got enough folks. Let's get started. So today's episode of The Gathering Room is called Your Perfect Problems because I have been seeing more than ever before that problems are like really good friends who really annoy you. Friends that you wish would not say the things that they say, but then once they've said them, you have to admit you needed to hear it. Problems, mm, they help us get out of the illusions that lie within each and every human mind as we start our lives. So, um, for example, if you are growing up and you are told you're not good enough or that you're inferior to different kinds of people or that um, the customer is always right or whatever it is you're taught, if it doesn't agree with what's deeply true for you in your heart and soul, it will cause suffering. It causes a sense of things being wrong. It takes you off your path. It makes you make the wrong decisions for you. Example I've used many times, you know, I was raised Mormon, happened to be gay. I don't know if I would have identified as gay, if I'd even identified as dating before I was an adult, but um, you know, it never even occurred to me because I couldn't, because that would be a sin and it would be horrible. And um, that took some unlearning right? Like I had a belief in me, got it completely innocently, but it didn't match what was deeply true for my heart and soul. You probably have the same thing. We all do. We all have beliefs that we've taken from either socialization or some kind of difficult experience where we drew a conclusion and included it in our belief system, but it's not in resonance with the deepest truth at our core. Ro and I have been having this um, discussion a lot because uh, we're talking about things that haven't happened yet and how you can get really, really miserable about the possibility of something happening. Um, and I keep saying to her, well, to me, if it's causing that much suffering, the belief we have is wrong. Like I will, uh, I will always be worthless or something like that. If you believe that strongly, yes, it's a negative thought. It makes you feel bad. But to me, the worst aspect of it is that it's going against something you know in your core. So I'm never meant to succeed. Something like that. If you're not meant to succeed at something, it's like, mm. like I tried to teach myself to play the piano. I tried hard. I played the piano like six hours a day for years, <laughs> starting at 26 or something. I was not good. I didn't have a teacher. I just plunked around, but I loved it. And then I had to admit, yeah, this is not... I'm never going to be good at this. And that did not hurt my feelings. It was just like, meh, I didn't start till I was 28. I never had a teacher. What do you expect? However, when I was trying to get Expecting Adam published, my first book that I wrote as a novel, and I kept getting rejections, and I would think it's never going to happen. I would be devastated, wiped out, six feet under, couldn't move. And the only way I could get out of bed was I would start thinking, well, my English teacher in high school seemed to think I could write, or like I would start building a little tiny, tiny structure of reasons to believe that I could be a writer. And then I would get out of bed and I would be happy. I now believe, 2020 hindsight, I now believe that the reason I was able to get out of bed when I believed that I could be successful at what I loved, the reason is that I was now in resonance with the truth. So we all have these innocent illusions, lies we tell ourselves that we don't know are lies. And coming out of illusion is the way to enlightenment, the end of suffering. So what the masters tell us is that once you've 
gotten rid of all your illusions and you see the world as it, and the universe as it actually is, you will not suffer anymore. You'll understand your own nature as a spiritual being that comes in and out of form, but does never have to worry about being dead because it can't be, it is life itself. Your body will be dead, but your essence will not. Um, it may, whew, I just got really distracted into a very long tangent that I'm not gonna indulge. Mm, focus, I have ADD. It's okay, I believe it's okay. So anyway, you're going along, you think you have an illusion, you need to get out of that illusion to get out of your suffering. But the weird thing is because it's built into your belief system, you can't see it. It's like trying to see the, your, the color of your own eyes without a mirror. Because the eyes are your way of seeing, you can't, they can't see themselves without some kind of reflection. Well, the reflection that shows up for us is in the form of problems. Suffering increases, it doesn't decrease. If, we, if somebody comes up to you and tells you the whole truth, right there, the truth about your life. You are good enough. You are an eternal soul. You, everyone who loves you will always love you and you, you will always love them. Everything's fine. If they just walk up and told you that, you would think, okay, nutcase, bye, next. You wouldn't say, oh, that's so clear now. I understand it because it has to get you at a very deep, deep level. Now, there are two ways that we come by our illusions. One of them is that people tell us things that aren't true as my oldest child says, belief, what is it? Yeah, belief is just say, people saying something near you enough times, something like that. They put it better, but that's the essence of it. So people will tell you things like, um, you can only be, uh, you should have a nuclear family just like in Leave it to Beaver, that's the only acceptable family. All right, if that's how your nature goes, you'll never question that. But if your family breaks down for some reason and you have this, this problem, you perceive it to be a problem, it's because what you've been taught doesn't match what you're experiencing. And so you experience things like shame, a sense of failure, a feeling that everything's wrong about you and about the situation. And it's not, you know, how many of us have gotten divorced and like 20 years later went, yeah, that had to go that, had to go that way. In the middle of it, we fight like crazy for our belief systems. So that's one way. The other way is more pernicious in a way. It's what happens to us at a level that is deeply physiological and subverbal. So the way that we learn things that put, pull us into illusion is that our brains take in information from the outside. Somebody tells me, this is what a family looks like. Mommy, daddy, two kids, one dog, white picket fence, done. That comes through the cortex, right? But Say you are in a traffic accident, or say you experience trauma before the age of two, but it's massive, like there's a war or something. What will happen then is that a very primitive part of your brain called the amygdala, which I've spoken of many, fondly many times, will get sensitized to the things that happened right before something went horribly wrong, right before. Like if you, oh, I once had a lime popsicle, and then I got a really, I got really sick as a kid. Have not eaten a lime popsicle since in all my many years. That lime popsicle, as far as I was concerned, caused everything. <laughs> so whatever happens right before a trauma, that will trigger you if you encounter it later in life, but you won't understand why it's triggering you because it's not known to your cortex, right? So I was talking to someone this week who is having had a very, very serious disruption in childhood, had to be separated from her parents in childhood. Now she's in a situation where she's separated from loved ones in a very specific way. And we were sort of marveling over how the situation that's going on now is directly triggering all this stuff that happened with her before she was even talking. So it's bringing up a lot of pain. And this is what problems do when they first show up. But I've noticed how problems are literally crafted. I don't know if it's by our, you know, our, our subconscious minds or by our higher selves or both, but they're, they're like handcrafted to trigger either the belief we're meant to let go of or the association in the amygdala that we're there to, that we need to get rid of. So if you, 
the way your problems show up, start looking at the thing that you hate most about them, right? So I hate most about this. You know, I married an alcoholic and what I hate most about this is that my father was an alcoholic. I, this, I have never married an alcoholic. This is hypothetical. Um, nor was my father an alcoholic. I'm giving an example. So again, I'm with someone with addiction issues. That was my father. That was his father. It's just, I can't believe this is happening again. It's happening again in the same way, partly because you're repeating the same patterns, but mostly I believe because it wants to show you, okay, here's what's not good about alcoholism. And it feels so bad. You're going to have to question what you believe. Oh, it's okay to have a six or seven drinks before breakfast. Then you get, you're in a situation where it's not okay. And you have to really, you have to face that. I'm using a very exaggerated example, but things will come up all the time. A very, very big one, I think, for those of us who show up at the gathering room has to do with self-esteem and self-value. So just notice when you have problems where you feel devalued or discarded or unimportant, you are not having to overcome the inadequacy of your being. You are being asked to shatter the, tr the core traumas that are causing you to not believe the truth. So Gloria Steinem famously wrote a book called The Truth Will Set You Free, but first it will piss you off. You will have a problem that hits you right on the rough spot. And you'll be like, why is the universe so cruel that it's going all through my grown up sense of self, my armor and hitting me right in the place where I got really hurt when I was a year and a half old? Well, it's happening out of grace. It's happening because if pain calls your attention to it, you have to look at this association or this belief. I remember I had, a, speaking of fathers, I had trauma that was related to my father early in my life. And he had, he was prematurely gray. By the time I was born, he had completely white hair. I used to be intensely afraid, panicky, every time I saw a man with white hair anywhere. I didn't even realize that's what was happening. I just kept freaking out. And then I finally realized that's what was doing it. So I had to break the association in my amygdala between like people with white hair are problematic. I had to disbelieve that. And then I had repeated episodes in my life of being discriminated against because of my gender. I've told you guys about that. Got the top SAT scores in my high school. They brought me and the two, the second and third place scorers down to the principal's office for career advising. And their advice to me was, wow, Martha, if you were a man, you'd have a great future. Now go back to class. We're going to talk to these two boys about their future. So that pissed me off and it made me really explore. I went I, and got a PhD in the sociology of gender and it helped me bust through a lot of cultural um, assumptions that are still in place today. But I think most of us here on the gathering room don't believe they're true. And then you look back and you say, well, I can't believe I believe that. I mean, it's so obviously not true. And I'm feeling so happy without the belief. But I have this other issue that's really a problem. Whatever problems there are in your life, just notice that where they piss you off the most, where they hurt you the most, where you're freaking out the most, that is exactly where to look for either what you were taught that isn't true or what you're associating with trauma or frightening things that is not necessarily true. And as you go into those, those are the things, the chains we need to break to free the soul because the ego is made up of those illusions, right? And it's all about self-protection and not letting itself fall apart. Problems will make it fall apart. So there was another, David Foster Wallace, another terrific writer said, the truth will set you free, but first it will have its way with you. So yes, it messes with your life and that is grace. And I will be taking questions now about this very topic from the amazing and gracious Badger Rowan Mangan. So um, La Luna says, how do you break patterns? Okay, you break patterns when they don't work. If your patterns are working for you, keep them. If they're not working for you, do not keep them. For example, I kept trying to be a morning person almost my whole life. I would get up early, I would go to bed early, 
And I would sleep from about two in the morning till I made myself get up at six or seven or whatever it was. And it was not enough sleep. And it went on for decades. Okay. It didn't work. I finally realized that you have to be a morning person is a cultural assumption that I no longer believe. Uh, some people are just innately night owls. Switch to that, move my life around. I still get laughed at by morning larks, but I don't care. I've broken that pattern. Mm -hmm. And I did it because it hurt to keep the pattern in place. That's how you do it. You suffer till you break it. Jamie Lynn says, what's the problem that I hate? What is the problem that I hate most? Oh, what if the problem that I hate most is my own thoughts, my fear of not getting things exactly right, which keeps me from taking action. I would strongly suggest that you get like a behavioral cognitive therapist or do the fabulous Byron Katie work that I love. Byron Katie is a spiritual teacher who comes on uh, and gives you a, uh, you can get a free version of her, I think every Wednesday and Thursday, she does a live session with people. Um, so all of that is to say that you, if your thoughts are what is causing you the most suffering, first of all, you are very, very much in the majority. Thoughts cause almost all our suffering. Identifying the thoughts that hurt most and then questioning them is how we get back into integrity. You see all these many copies I have of my own book called The Way of Integrity. It's all about wherever you suffer, you can zoom in to a thought that is probably attaching you to the problem and getting rid of the thought makes the problem go away. I will give you an example. I have a fabulous bird feeder and um, Ro got me this bird feeder as a special present when there was a bird epidemic and I was really destroyed by it emotionally. She got me the Taj Mahal of bird feeders and then the squirrels came and they did eat so much of the seed and I fought them psychically, I fought them physically, I fought them verbally, I fought them in every way I knew to fight them and then I outfoxed them. I questioned the thought it's wrong for squirrels to eat bird seed. <laughs> and then I renamed my Taj Mahal the squirrel and bird feeder. And ever since then, the squirrels, the birds and I have been friends. The raccoons are driving me out of my freaking mind, but that's a topic for another. I mean, they just destroy property for the fun of it. No, focus Martha, focus back. I'm gonna have to question my thoughts about raccoons and my associations about raccoons later on today. But the idea is, most of us are thinking thoughts that are causing problems that really aren't problems. And when you question the thoughts themselves and go into a freedom from all thinking, which is just, woo, here I am, you simply perceive the world without a filter of thoughts and your problems almost always go away. The only ones left are the association-based ones. And if you question those in a similar way, but very gently, they will go away too. Dr. Donna says, when you're triggered, how do you interrupt behaviors that reinforce the belief? For example, right now I'm feeling devalued and like someone believes I'm not good enough. My typical response is to try harder, to do more, to go above and beyond, to attempt to make myself have value. Well, Dr. Donna, I know you to be a researcher and we are all researchers in a sense. When we go out looking for the truth, we are acting like scientists. We take our beliefs, we put them to the test of reality and we see if it's true. Like, do all people have to be morning larks? There are societies where not everyone is a morning lark. Everybody, you know, there are night owls in the world, it's fine. The evidence doesn't bear out the hypothesis. So if you are feeling like someone believes you're not good enough, let me tell you, the scientific way to resolve the problem. Go to that person and say, I believe you think I'm not good enough. Tell me where I'm wrong. Tell me if it's true or if it's not. Do you really devalue me? I did this with my um, PhD advisor. I think I've told you this. He, he used to swear at me. He was a Danish dude. And I think that he thought certain English um, uh, words that were, um, he thought they were adjectives. In fact, they were expletives and he used them lavishly. He called me more swear words than I can even begin to list, certainly not here. And at a certain point, I just said to him, do you hate me and swear at me because you were trying to hurt my feelings or motivate me or something? Or is that just how you talk and the way you teach? And he said, oh no, that's just the way I talk and the way I teach. And I was like, okay. 
And he kept doing it and it stopped bothering me. I know it's scary to ask them, but you gotta break the pattern by not um, believing the thought before it's tested. You have to test it. We, we make assumptions about what other people think and then we react as if our assumptions are true and we may end up hating the person and we never even ask them if our assumption was right. Okay, so that's your challenge, Dr. Donna. Go and ask them. Mark says, any tips on figuring out that, asso that association to previous trauma when we don't have specific memories? Yes, keep a log, keep a journal of it or keep a journal in your phone. Whenever you have a freak out, look at the situation, see if you can remember what was the situation right before. So the brain is so fascinating. It, it will record anything that happens a millisecond before like a bomb going off and that specific thing will trigger us. So one of the books I've been reading had the example of a Vietnam vet who came back, he had PTSD, got some treatment for it, stopped having panic attacks, everything was fine. 10 years later, he started having panic attacks every single morning and he couldn't figure out why. And he was like, oh my God, I'm going back to PTSD. This is a nightmare. And it turned out that he, he, he zeroed in on the time it was happening. And then he realized it was happening in the shower. And the reason was that his, his wife had started buying the same brand of soap that he had used as a soldier in Vietnam 10 years earlier. And it was the smell of the soap, which by the way, doesn't even go through the cortex. It just goes right from your nose to your amygdala, wham. Um, yeah, that was triggering him and he had to figure it out like a detective. So it's actually quite interesting to try to figure out what's, what's triggering you from that amygdala. But it's interesting once you're done. It's not so much, in, so much interesting as horrifying when you're actually going through it. But Mark, good luck. So Allison says, how do you train yourself not to be activated by a trigger? Oh, this is so good. Okay, so this is the whole reason I was gonna talk about this actually. Um, having read about this, I realized that to decondition an amygdala based fear reaction, the only way is to be in the presence of the trigger and wait for the panic to go down and see that nothing bad happens and to do this over and over and over again. So if you ever, I used to watch the dog whisperer, um, Cesar Milan, the dog whisperer and he would go work with problem dogs. And if you had an aggressive dog, Caesar had no problem. He's like, oh, no worries. I just got to prove that you're the alpha. So he would like treat the, the animal the way an assertive dog pack leader would act. And the dog would suddenly stop being aggressive and go, oh, thank God you're in charge. I was hating being the alpha. It's a lot of responsibility, a lot of pressure on me here. But if he had a dog that had that was very timid and anxious and triggery, he would say, okay, now we're in for the long haul because this dog has to be in the presence of what triggers panic and see that nothing's going wrong many, many times. So for example, if that Vietnam vet wanted to just stop using that soap, great. But if he wanted to get over the trigger, he would have to deliberately let the smell of the soap trigger him and then look at it and say, it's just soap. It's just soap. Um, Jeffrey Schwartz, a psychiatrist who was one of the first people to write about neuroplasticity, worked with people who had compulsive hand washing disorder. And their thoughts were, there are germs everywhere, I've got to wash my hands. And they would wash their hands to the point where it was taking off the skin. And then he took, so Jeffrey Schwartz took pictures. All these people were trying to explain to the hand washers, your hands aren't that dirty. You have to just sit there and take it. What he did was he gave them an alternate story. He gave them pictures of fMRIs. No, they only had MRIs at the time. Pictures of MRIs of their brains and with a little flash of light where the compulsion was triggering the brain. And he would have them say, when you want, when you want to wash your hands, he said, just hold the slide of your brain and look at the little light and say, that's what's happening. It's, a, it's an electrical impulse in my brain. So it gave them a way to sit with the panic and have a different thing happen. And he had a really good success rate where a lot of other therapists were failing really badly. So when you get triggered, so I, I had a little scare a couple of days ago and I woke up in the middle of the night having a really strong fear reaction, which doesn't usually happen. My heart was pounding. I had adrenaline. I was like, yes, 
because this is like my nightmare scenario because I'm afraid of insomnia and fear of insomnia creates insomnia. And now I was like at high level alert in the middle of the night and all the fears were coming in. I'm not gonna be able to get back to sleep. I'm gonna be a wreck tomorrow. I'm gonna, do you know what lack of sleep does to you? you know, like scary. And I was like, no, no, no. I have to sit with the wakefulness, sit with the pounding heart, sit with the adrenaline and just allow myself to see that nothing that bad is really happening. So I used all my skills from the books I've been reading and I told myself, you know, but it's just, I imagine my amygdala was a bunny and I just petted the bunny. I was just like, it's okay. It was a very furry bunny. The furriness of it was very soothing to my whole soul. So I was soothing the bunny, the bunny was soothing me and we went back to sleep. It was amazing. And then it happened again last night and I put myself back to sleep much faster. It works, it's working. And I was so excited that I was having the problem so that I could recondition my amygdala. <laughs> oh, problems are great friends. So, um, Disenlightened says, how would you suggest breaking the amygdala connection when you've had a lot of trauma from betrayal and its aftermath? You need to, you know, where I, I was petting my amygdala like a bunny and I was in a comfortable bed and a house full of people who loved me and everything was fine. You really do need to get yourself out of a situation that is genuinely dangerous. So the first order of business is look around, see, are you actually in danger? Because a lot of people who've had lots of trauma and betrayal are having it right now. Like they have an ongoing problem with a parent who, like I was talking to another friend and um, her mother used to be extremely physically violent and her father just watched it happen. And she's not talking to her mother, but her father was talking to her and he just watched it happen. And she's never challenged that in him. When she tries, he laughs it away, pushes it away, and it breaks her heart all over again. That's not a safe place for her. She keeps trying and trying and trying to break the pattern and it won't break. That means she has to stop expecting that from that person. And that may mean she, she needs distance from that person. So you have to establish safe boundaries first, and then you go about the process of saying, look, everything's okay, everything's okay, everything's okay. But the first order of business is don't let the trauma continue. Okay, Aggie says, hi, Martha and Ro. Oh, Aggie, it's Aggie. When there are lots of different problems in different departments, like love, housing, professional happening at once, what belief could be questioned? Well, I think sometimes it's just the hanging on to the entire structure of our life and identity that needs to be questioned. Like, oh, this is bad. This is very, very bad. If I have several problems that pile up, I will often become very, very frustrated, confused and upset until I have the thought, oh, this is the storm before the calm. This is the perfect storm. Some, the force is setting this up. Now, whether or not it's true, I don't know. <laughs> but when I say, oh, this is the storm before the calm, this only happens when something really good is coming because that's been my life experience that right before a good something happens, you often get a perfect storm of problems because it bursts you into a new level. So then as soon as I stop believing that it's just blind fate and God hates me, as soon as I think, oh no, the force is trying to set me free and something really good is going to happen, boom, immediately, even in the presence of the problems, the suffering disappears because it's true. Sometimes I try that one, it doesn't work. That's because I still need to fix the problem. And um, yeah, you feel around for the solution that bursts the illusion and it's what brings you that feeling of peace, calm, integrity. Okay, and by the way, if you want to learn all about this, how to handle all those problems, sign up for Wayfinder Life Coach Training. It's a good way to get all my thoughts on that. Okay, Sharon says, I feel scared a lot, especially at night before I'm about to fall asleep. That's when I start to worry or ruminate. Is that a trauma thing or do most people's monsters come out at night? Yes, yes, yes. For those of us who don't sit down to meditate every morning, the time when we let ourselves go still is when we lie down to sleep. And of course, Pascal said, the source of all our misery is our inability to sit quietly alone in a room. If we don't sit quietly alone in rooms, then we eventually lie down quietly, maybe not alone, but in a room generally, and whew, the monsters come out of hiding. I would suggest letting them out earlier in the day 
because when you practice, like I used to just, I heard Deepak Chopra say, uh, it's RPM, rise, pee, and meditate. And I was like, okay, I'll take that on for a year or two. And so I did that the very first thing, boom, meditate first thing and all the monsters would come first thing in the freaking morning. It was horrible. Went on for months and then it stopped. <laughs> and then I stopped feeling anxiety while I was meditating and then I stopped feeling anxiety when I wasn't meditating and then I only felt anxiety when something was specifically triggering me and then I would sit down and meditate and explore it until I found the connection and started breaking the beliefs that weren't true and that's what I did last night and the night two nights ago when I managed to rouse up a little trauma in the night it was great because without the problem my amygdala would never fix itself and my cortex would never fix its own beliefs. And I would never move forward toward reality, toward the appreciation of life as an exciting adventure that is all here for our own ultimate joy. So I hope you have fun this week um, playing with your problems and challenging yourself and breaking the patterns and seeing where it's all perfect. The problems are all actually some of the most perfect parts of our lives. So enjoy your problems this week and I will be staggering around the house with insomnia in a state of joy and um, enlightenment. <laughs> Not really. I see you guys later. Thank you so much for coming. Bye.